I think we're live. Ah! <laughs> I have been so excited to get on with you guys and just like ah, celebrate everything. It's so crazy to think how like just a week ago, I was so much in the stress of like, oh my gosh, this book has to come together. I need everything to come together. I'm like staying up, like trying so hard to make everything go. And now it's out. And it's like, <sighs> just like pure relief, 100%. And I just can't believe it. Oh my gosh, you guys, this has been such a crazy ride. It's like I knew that when it launched, it was going to do well on Apple because I could see the pre-orders coming in. And so I was like, okay, it's going to do pretty well. But I think, I mean, I'm not, I can't hundred percent remember, but I think that like maybe the highest I've ever launched at Apple books for a brand, like a brand new book. Cause when you do like book bub ads or stuff like that, you can get pretty high up, but that's because you're building on somebody else's audience, right? Which is still amazing and worth celebrating, but it's always like so satisfying when it's just your full priced new released book that you didn't pay for any advertising. You just put it out into the world um, to see it do really well. And I think, you know, I've seen my book in the top 50 at Apple before on a release. I've been number one at fantasy. I've been number one in paranormal, but I've never been number one as far as I can remember in science fiction and fantasy, which is kind of like the big broad category that includes pretty much everything that's not like a contemporary book. Um, and then, so I had told George, I was like, it's going to be exciting when it finally goes live on Apple to see, you know, where the ranking is. And of course the ranking is not the be all end all of whether or not a book is successful, because there are tons of people who do incredibly well, who never hit number one on anything. It, you know, it's not the most important thing, but it is also at the same time, really fun and worth celebrating when you do hit a high ranking. And when I was like, let me go and check. And it was number five. And I was like, what? I thought for sure I was seeing it wrong or something. And so I went into Apple UK and was like, well, let me see how it's doing over there. Cause I know I have a lot of UK fans that purchase from Apple and it was number one. And I thought I must be on the like paranormal list or something. I can't be on like the whole store because that would be crazy. But it was like number one best selling book. It's probably not there anymore, I'm sure, because it doesn't tend to stay there very long. But even just to get there at all is just was so huge. And then yesterday when I was checking on my phone for Google Playbooks, I did see that it was like ranking number one. I kept seeing my book with um, Kim Harrison's Million Dollar Demon book. Um, and I was like, well, I'm up there, but I haven't hit the top 100. And there was a couple year period there where I would, every book I put out hit the top 100. And at one point at Google Books, I had like five books in the top 100, which I know as readers, a lot of you don't really understand this, but or you're not like in the industry talk. But Google Play Books is heavily skewed toward traditionally published books. Like Amazon is really the one that has the most indie sales because of Kindle Unlimited. But if you go into Kindle Unlimited, you have to be exclusive to Amazon. And I just have never wanted to do that. It's never been like the thing that I wanted to do. And so all these other stores kind of uh, promote the traditionally published books more, more than they do indie books. And so to see indie books on the top 100 at Google Play is more rare. And they don't allow, I think, 99 cent books and deal type books to be on the list. And so I was like, well, you know, it's fine if I don't hit the top 100 at Google, but it has been a couple books since I was able to do it. And I've never launched a book at the top, like in the top 25. So when I looked this morning and it was top 25, it was like number 22 <laughs> at, at Google Play in the top 100 books. I was just like completely floored and it was trending at Kobo in the top 50. Um, and it, it just was so exciting. And even, even Amazon. So like 
for those of you that don't know, it's really hard to rank high at Amazon if you're not in Kindle Unlimited because Kindle Unlimited books get extra ranking for people who download the book, you know, that don't pay for the book other than in their subscription. And it actually weighs a little bit heavier. So someone who gets a download for free in Kindle Unlimited gets a little bit better sales ranking than someone who gets a full price paid book because Amazon's trying to promote their free free books in Kindle Unlimited. So if you go to like the top 100 lists on Kindle, most of the time what you're going to see is traditionally published books that have huge marketing budgets and different things like that. And you'll see mostly Kindle Unlimited books. And very rarely will you see a full priced indie book that is not in Kindle Unlimited. And so there, <laughs> I didn't quite break even the top 1000 because it is so, so hard to do if you're not in Kindle Unlimited. Um, but I did hit number one in seven different categories for new release. So that was pretty huge. I was not expecting that. So <sighs> it's just been, I, I can't even explain. It's just been such a great <laughs> relief. <laughs> to have that. And, you know, it is, it is true, you know, you worry for nothing, but it is true that I still have about 400 sales that were pre-orders that have not come in for the book um, on Amazon. So I don't know if those people will come back to purchase or if I've just lost those sales forever. And I, you know, I can't, I can't worry about it. I know it was a less than ideal situation, but at the same time, you have to, um, you have to do what you know is best for yourself long-term. And so today <laughs> in just a general, oh yeah, 200 people. Hello everybody. <laughs> so I think that what you have to do in the end, you know, we would love for things to be ideal and it would be great to be able to hit every deadline, make every, you know, reader happy, get the books out as fast as possible. But this is one of those kinds of things where you, you have to weigh like when things cannot be the perfect way, you have to weigh the pros and cons. Like if I had pushed out the book to try to hit the pre-order and I had not gotten those twists and turns the way that felt really good, I would be disappointed in this book for the rest of my life. Maybe there would be more bad reviews and people would be like, this feels rushed or there weren't as good twists or, you know, whatever. Um, and five years from now, when people are still discovering this book, the way that they are still discovering Demons Forever and other things like that, they wouldn't know that I had a deadline to meet. They would just know that the book wasn't quite as good as the other books, right? And so you have to think about what about the people that discover this long term? There is so much more that goes into a book than just this moment in time and this one moment of release. It's kind of like you think about it like people say like book birthdays or your book baby, but it is kind of like a baby as well. It's like, you know, my birthing experience with Andrew having an emergency C-section was not the way that I wanted to bring him into the world. That was not my ideal thing because it was a little bit scary. But in the end, that's just a very small piece of his life was that moment. And after that, we're just happy we have a healthy baby, you know, and it's just a, it's just a moment in time. And so that release, as exciting as it is to, to hit the pre-orders and as good as it is to like make your friends trust you or your readers trust you and all of those kinds of things. You also have to weigh like what's more important. And for me, it was just so it's always so much more important that the book be the way that it needs to be. And it's hard to explain that to thousands of people, but I'm so glad that I have you guys here to talk to about it and that you guys have been with me on this journey and really listening. Cause I know a lot of you are writers too, that are here. Um, and those of you that aren't writers are interested in what happens behind the scenes, but it's one of those things of like, there's this little, like, I don't know, little thing that is like an intuitive, intuitive intuition type thing that says, 
this just isn't quite right. This isn't quite good enough. This isn't the way it should be. There's something still missing. And when I felt that the first way through, so I can talk about it a little bit without giving spoilers for those of you that have read it now, let me know in the comments if you have actually read the book without giving me any spoilers, just say yes. I know Christabel has read it. Um, Vanessa, I think it is a very healthy baby. <laughs> it had it had a troubled birthing, but it is a healthy baby and hopefully will be loved and beloved by people for many years to come. But um, I think that, you know, it was some, it was parts of the mid, the middle of the book. So I'll just say like roses and storm, like the things that are happening about 50% through the book that it was like starting there and with the, what the twins go through was totally different just three weeks ago. And I, I, just knew this isn't quite the path that they need to be on. It's almost right, but it's just not quite right. And then there were parts of Harper's story towards the end where I didn't have her where I needed her to be. And I kept thinking, this isn't right either. This isn't right either. Something about this is just not right. And I couldn't define it. I couldn't tell you what it was. I just, it's just a feeling deep inside where you go, this isn't right. And it's like getting on a plane when you're like, something's going to happen. What's that? What's that movie um, where they all, <laughs> they all get off the plane and then they all die one by one. <laughs> Maybe not a good example, but it's just that kind of thing of like, I've got to get off this plane because I feel that it's not right. And that's the way I felt about the book is this just isn't right. And if I walked away from it and said, you know what, it's just going to be it's just going to be good enough. Final destination. Thank you, Paris <laughs> and Angela. Oh, several people got, got there. Nicole, <laughs> final destination. Um, George loves those movies because there's somebody gets hit by a bus and he just always loves it when there's like that surprise get hit by a bus moment, like in Mean Girls. I don't know why he, it always makes him laugh, but um, <laughs> snakes on a plane. <laughs> um, yeah, it's final destination. It's like when you know something isn't right. Now, hopefully nothing bad comes of it. So that's why I was like, probably not the best example, but it's just that intuitive knowing of this is not the perfect thing. And I, sometimes I think I, I want to, I've been trying to think of how to express this. And if you're an author, maybe you will understand what I'm trying to say, even though I can't fully decide or express how to say it is that sometimes, and even if you're not an author, maybe you relate to this. Sometimes I think that when you, oh, I hope I can say this the way I want to say it. When you try to tell people, I need more time for my art. <laughs> I need more time to get it right. Sometimes there's that other voice inside you that goes, uh, maybe I can't really say that because my art doesn't compare to like Brandon Sanderson or Kim Harrison or, you know, Kate Quinn or whoever else that you're looking and comparison, you know, comparing yourself to. And so I think that sometimes there's a part of us that says, who am I to take more time for my art when I'm nobody? Which I'm not saying I feel like I'm nobody, but there's just that feeling every once in a while that comes in that says, um, it sounds pretentious to say, I need more time to get this just right. When I know that I'm still not as good as some other people, or I don't feel like I have learned enough about my art to be like the best person in the world. So then it gets hard to stand up and say, this is what I need to create my art because it's like, your art isn't good enough anyway. Right. Imposter syndrome, right? It's a very similar type of thing. It's it's this feeling of like, I know I need the time to make it my very best, but I also am scared that other people are looking at me saying, who cares anyway, right? Because your best isn't still isn't anywhere near as good as this other person. What do you think that you're creating? Um, and I think that a lot of us go through that, not because we aren't good, <laughs> but because we're so scared of what other people will think of us. And um, because I am so incredibly aware of how much I still need to learn as an author, which truthfully, 
I think every author feels that way because we always continue to grow. I've talked about this before that Stephen King talks about how no matter how many books he's written, he still feels like he's a newbie because he's never going to be as good as he wants to be. And he's always learning. Um, And so there's that feeling of like, can I take this extra time to make it amazing when I know like 10 years from now, I'll look back on it and be like, gosh, that book was nothing compared to where I am now. Does that make kind of sense? Um, It's so it, yeah, it can be hard to say I'm going to take this time. (sighs) There's an old commercial that the tagline was, we shall serve no wine before it's time. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And I think that's true. And and I think what you have to step back from is to say, um, this is kind of my roundabout encouraging way to say that no matter where you are in your process, it's still important to take the time you need to do your very best, no matter if it's the best Stephen King could have produced or the best, you know, Kim Harrison could have done or who, you know, Terry Pratchett or whoever else. It's like, it doesn't have to be their best. I'm not trying, I'm, if I was trying to be their best, maybe I'd never publish my book ever, but I do owe it to myself and to my readers for it to be my very best. But of course, <laughs> we would like for our very best to also go in line with what deadlines we set out for each, you know, for ourselves and for our readers. So uh, it it was quite a challenge because I was really, really nervous about how it would be received. And I know I was disappointing people along the way. But hopefully now that you have the book in your hands, you are feeling like it was worth the wait. But it was definitely a huge relief and a release. Um, and we are going to talk today, obviously, about the six months for life project. And I know there are a lot of you that are looking to participate in this. So if you want to uh, comment and say, I did see that there was a comment that came by a few minutes ago, by the way, that I wanted to mention um, or to answer. Somebody asked, when is the paperback coming out? And I literally five minutes before I got on the live, I published the paperback. So Raven sent me the paperback. This paperback is 460 pages long. So it's my longest book. Um, And it should be up like I published it, it should be up in the next three days. Sometimes they get it done, like by the end of the day, like it might be ready by tomorrow, but we'll just kind of see kind of where it is. So Yay, I'm seeing definitely people saying it's worth the wait. (laughs) Um, So yeah, this is cool. This is a good group of people here today too. I'm so glad you guys are here to celebrate with me. (laughs) Um, But we are going to talk about this uh, six months for life project. So a lot of you are participating in this. If you had not uh, heard about this before, we're going to talk a little bit about it. I'm going to tell you a little bit of guidelines about how I decided what I'm working on. And if that might help guide you, if you want to, you know, step into this project, um, Jennifer said, how many words is that? It's almost 115,000 words in this book. It's a, lo- it's a long one for me. Um, but then, you know, I look at people like Brandon Sanderson and some of my heroes like Robert Jordan, and I'm like, how do they, I, how did they do it? Like 250,000 words books, like I, that are so brilliantly connected and all of this. But there is also a part of me when I'm writing four points of view here that I'm like 115,000 words really is only, you know, 30,000 words or less of each person. And so I, I I just kept thinking like originally this rough draft of this book was about 93,000 words. So I added 20,000 more words onto it over the last like five days before release. (laughs) I was, I was in it though. The flow was happening. It was like, this is what it's needed all along. And I just had to stop looking at the word count because I was like, I, I understand now how it all comes together. And so I just had to go, I just had to go for it and say, stop thinking about how long it is. Stop thinking about how long it is. And yes, those authors do often work on their books for years. Like some of those authors work on those books for you know, five years or more. Um, now, I think Brandon Sanderson tends to put his out relatively quickly. Um, 
But a lot of the books like, you know, George R. R. Martin and the other fantasy novels and, and people that are writing multiple POV like what I am doing do take years and years. But that's the thing about being indie is it gets more and more difficult. I think that readers are much more tolerant of traditionally published authors not putting out a book for two to five years because it's just the way it's always been done. But the more and more indies put out books like you know, candy, just like doling them out every three weeks, the more readers get impatient um, for the books to come out. And so, you know, we try to toe that line and we just keep working forward. But I think that it is affirming <laughs> to life affirming to see that even after two and a half, like the previous book in this series came out in October or early November of 2018. So we're talking about almost three years ago, the previous book came out. And the fact that so many people were still here and still waiting and ready to buy the book and excited for the book almost three years later is just, a lot of people would say that isn't possible in indie, but I, I really hope that those of you watching know that it does it does happen. You just have to write your very best book and you have to do the best you can to continue on. Um, it's, it's hard, but it is possible. <laughs> so don't feel like you have to, I really and truly feel like you can make a really great career for yourself as an indie with just writing two books a year and you would be doing great. But I think so many people out there teach that, oh, you got to put out 12 books a year. And then there are some people who can't do that. Most of us can't do that and maintain quality. And so it just becomes this very difficult thing, but it's a hard thing to talk about because I never want to, judge other authors for the quality of their books just because they're putting out books quickly because there are people who can put out books very quickly that write great books. And so I, I can't judge that, but I just see a lot of people um, pushing themselves beyond what is a healthy, reasonable limit in order to get the books out faster, thinking that that will be the key. But I will say JD, what are you doing here? Oh my gosh, are you not traveling? Are you already in DC? <laughs> hello, hello. I was not expecting to see you here. Um, JD, my friend JD, you guys, I've talked about her before. She has a YouTube channel. She was one of my very first uh, critique partners. So she was right there from the beginning of Beautiful Demons. Um, she was with me every night, you guys, for the last two weeks, almost every night on Zoom calls doing writing sprints with me. And I would, this book would not exist without her. So thank you. Thank you, Jen. I love you so much. Um, definitely love you. But I, um, I really feel like there's so many people that push themselves back past the normal healthy limit to try to get books out really fast. And then what happens is the books aren't very good and they don't know why the quality or why the sales aren't coming in. And it's a really, it's a really hard thing to juggle because it's like, how do you, how do you get the books out fast enough and make sure that they're also going to be something that people want to buy? And I think that you have to step back from the fear and you have to trust yourself. And that is a hard thing to do too. Um, so Deb says late to the party. What is six months for life? Okay. So we're going to talk about this a little bit. Um, Charlie, I did see, I think you posted in one of the groups. I saw that and I almost um, responded to it. 15 books in your series and currently writing the draft of book one, which I think is really awesome that you already have so much of it plotted out. When I first started writing Beautiful Demons back in 2010, I had no idea that it was going to be this long of a series. And so I didn't plan out any of this stuff. Like I didn't even know that I can say it now because we've read those books, but I didn't know Jackson was a demon at the very beginning. I didn't know anything about what Harper's heritage. You guys will learn more about that as we get into to the end of rival demons, which we're almost, you know, getting back to it. So it's one of those kind of things where I did not plan out enough. So you're doing a great job already being, you know, thinking about how much that you have, um, have done. And yeah, Katrina, it's like struggling to just get three books out. How could you do 12? And, you know, if I feel like, yeah, and that's, that is another part of it. A lot of people do hire ghostwriters, which I, again, I hate talking about it too. <laughs> yes. Well, I said, I can, I can say it because we've read them on this channel, but I guess maybe I should have been like, ah, <laughs> maybe 
spoiler alert, go read book two, <laughs> go listen to book two. Um, but yeah, I think that what I'm, what I'm seeing, I have one very good friend in particular who was like, okay, I'm starting to lose sales. And instead of stepping back and trying to write better books or trying to, you know, come up with a better strategy, her only thought was, I just need to write faster. And so for the past three years, I've been watching her write faster and faster, like to the point of 16 books a year. And she is using co-authors and, and ghostwriters and she's not happy. She's miserable. She's getting more and more ill. She's been in the hospital four or five times. And I'm just thinking, what are you doing? And her sales are probably half what they were three years ago. And so she keeps feeling like I have to go harder. I have to work harder. I have to work harder. And I think that that is more common in indie publishing than we realize. So if you are feeling that stress, I will just throw a plug in here that my um, Publish and Thrive course will be starting back up in August. So I will be opening the doors to that in late July because I feel like it is so important to step back and think about your mental health when it comes to writing. And this is a big part. This It's a very good uh, segue into the Six Months for Life project, which I am going to tell you about. So Six Months for Life is this idea. This is, I, I will caveat this and open it by saying, this is not something that I came up with thinking that I'm going to like teach people about, or I'm going to show people and that I'm going to lead people through. This is just something I was doing for myself. And I mentioned it and several of you were interested in it. So it's not something that I have come up with in terms of um, like publish and thrive or HB 90, where I'm like, I know how to teach this. This is just me kind of doing something for myself. And so it's not super polished in how I'm coming up with it. So I will just, we'll just do it together. Like we're just a group of friends rather than I'm like a teacher trying to teach you what to do. So I'll just caveat by saying that. Um, and we will talk about the house build because that is also very important. <laughs> important to why the last couple months of my life have been so difficult. Um, but we'll get into that in just a minute. Um, okay, so the first thing that I started doing uh, when, when I started thinking about the six months project is I can see how there are so many things in my life that I have control over that I just let pass me by because I'm too busy or because I'm too scared to really step into the best version of myself, or I know there are things that are holding me back and I don't fully understand why. Um, and so just another little bit of a warning. So we have 250 people here and I don't know if all of you have been around for a while or not. I'm used to like our little 112 people or so um, that have been around for a little bit more, but I will just warn you now that I'm going to talk about more personal things. So just trigger warning, I guess, like sexual assault, weight loss, diet, that kind of thing, postpartum being a mom. Um, so if you need to just go because that's not your thing, then I fully no judgment, just warning you that we're going to kind of get into some of that with six month project things. Um, but for me, it's like I can see so much of how I have grown from who I was 20 years ago to who I am now. And everybody grows, but I can see how, you know, really and truly, I've, I talked about this in one of my uh, heart breathings videos that back at the turn, well, gosh, what would I say? Probably starting in around 2008, back in 2008, I was living like the worst version of my life. I was smoking two packs a day of cigarettes and hiding them from trying, thinking that I was hiding them from people in my life, which I don't think you can smoke two packs a day and, and hide that really. But I was trying to hide it or keep it secret to a degree because I was a school teacher. Um, and this is again, no judgment against anybody who does smoke, but I just knew I, as somebody who was, has an, a master's degree in opera singing, <laughs> to have gone from that to smoking cigarettes and kind of not being able to sing as much as I wanted and not having the health that I wanted and the lung capacity, it was major self-sabotage mode. And this came off the heels of a uh, sexual assault in 2000. And I had, I was married to a super, super abusive person. I was working a job that I did not like, living in a place I did not like. I literally was not happy for even 
a second. I was very, very unhappy. And I was searching for anything, searching for something. And when I hit, this will age me a little bit, but in 2007, when I hit 30 years old, I was like, this cannot be my life. This will not be my life. I will not live this way anymore because I was so much at a low, low point that I contemplated suicide. I hurt myself a lot in secret. Um, and I was just, I was a very broken person and I was trying very, very hard to keep it together on the outside so that people who would see me wouldn't know just how bad it was. But I think people did see <laughs> um, because I had, I, I remember this was right around my 30th birthday, a little bit before my 30th birthday, I was at a Christmas party and somebody says to me, what happened to you? It's like, you used to have a light. It's like somebody just turned off the light in your eyes is what she said. And it was like, well, that's a fun thing to hear at a Christmas party. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, but it was, it was a turning point for me because I thought I am not half the person I thought I would be. And if I stay here, then I am going to regret my entire life. And that was a huge wake up call for me. And so I changed everything. And it was not easy. It's like, you know, 20 years later, you can look back and be like, so I did this, this and this. It was a struggle. It was really hard to do. But I quit my job. I quit, you know, I got divorced. I quit smoking. I changed everything about my life. Moved in with George. We got married, started a whole new life. I, I decided to be, that was the moment I decided to become a writer because I knew I, that was the job I wanted. Like this, I was just going to go after my life. And I know that that period of time in my life where I decided I was going to make those changes was just a small, it was a small time frame. Like we're looking at maybe eight months of my life that put me on a path to 20 years of better and better and better. And doesn't mean there weren't hard times. There's always hard times as we go. But I got the help that I needed. I started going to therapy and that was such a help. I really started, um, you know, facing what had happened to me and talking about it more, um, just the healing process. But for me, it was eight months of kind of intense change and, and deciding like just putting myself, like pointing myself in the direction of the life that I really wanted instead of trying to pretend I was happy in a life that I knew I didn't want. And I feel like I'm coming to another stage in my life now where I'm jumping, like the jumping off point right now is so much better than where I was in 2007. But I feel like in order to go to the next level, because what I want in my life is I want that TV deal. I want to be, I want number one at Apple books to be like something that happens with every book. And I don't know if that can really happen, but I am, I want to impact more lives. I want to continue to grow this community. I want to be there a hundred percent for people, for you guys. Um, and I know, I know what I want. And so from, you know, I was way down here, I moved myself up here, but I can still, now that I'm here, I can see this place that I want to go. And so here's what I will say about the six month project and why I was feeling, uh, I was feeling like doing this at this point in my life is I know from experience that the material things like the house, the car, those kind of things will not make you happy that you cannot like just take, if you take somebody who is at that low point that I was and plop me into a million dollar house, there's no joy there. It was a journey of healing on the inside that got me, that allowed me to move myself up to a new level. Um, Kayla, I just want a vacation. <laughs> well, that works too. Right. Um, but you know, it's, it's a, it's internal work that you have to do to get to that next level. And as an entrepreneur, no matter where you are, 
in whether you're an entrepreneur who does any kind of art or business or anything, the business so depends on you as a person that you you have to do the internal work. It's you can't just hustle culture your way to where you want to go because it doesn't last, in my opinion. I think you really, really have to um, do the internal work. You have to heal the things that hold you back, the self-sabotage and the hard things that that really you're scared to face in so many ways. And so I started thinking, you know, in six months, they're almost like, I can't control whether or not I get a TV deal, but I can control so many other things. I can control how hard I'm working. I can control what I'm eating and how much I'm sleeping, how much time I'm spending with my kids. I can control how I feel, like whether my house is a mess and I have too much stuff here, I have, I have so much control over how I show up in the world. And instead of using it for good, a lot of times I still self-sabotage. And I feel like if I can spend the next six months really doing the internal healing work to get myself beyond some of this and put myself in the right direction once again, that I can catapult myself to an even greater level of success. I don't know if this is making any sense. So just let me know. <laughs> um, Cause like I said, it's this kind of in, it's this internal kind of thing um, that is hard to explain because I wasn't like ex planning to like sh share it in this exact way. But what has been there for me over the past few months thinking about this project in this six month time period for the rest of this year is I've been thinking about my vision. Now I talk about my vision for life all the time. If you join any of my courses, if you take, you know, go to my heart breathing YouTube, like I talk about vision a lot because it's so important to me personally. And I think to many other people is knowing what you want. Like if you could sit down right now and just think, like one of the most powerful things that we do in the beginning of the HB90 class is a letter from future you to current you. And there's also, um, if you've read, what is that book? Playing Big by Tara Moore. I think it's called Playing Big. She has a meditation, like a visualization that she goes through, takes you through in that book where she has you meditate and imagine that you go like way up into the sky. And then when you come back down, you are seeing a version of yourself 10 years down the road or five years down the road or 20 years down the road, whatever applies for you, wherever you want to be in the future. And you get to come down in this meditation and have a conversation with the future version of yourself. And so that had a big impact on me thinking about that vision of like future Sarah, if, if I think about where I really want to be and my vision, what does that look like 10 years down the road when I'm in my 50s and my kids are starting to get a little bit older, maybe starting to get closer to graduating high school for Andrew? You know, what does what does that life look like? What kind of house am I living in? What kind of things do I feel on a daily basis? What do I spend my time on? Who are my friends? And I start thinking about those things. And I had this realization when I was doing this meditation is I thought, you know, if I had done that meditation 20 years ago, I don't even know that I would have been able to imagine the life that I have right now because it would have felt so foreign and impossible to me. But step by step, year by year, I have brought myself to this point. And now from this point, I can imagine an even more amazing future that I never would have dreamed of that many years ago. And so having this vantage point and being able to see that, you know, the distance between 2007, 30 year old Sarah and 44 year old Sarah sitting here right now was like this much distance. But really when I think about where I want to be in 10 years, I don't feel like I have that, that far farther to go. I feel like, gosh, I really have brought a lot into my life that is so beautiful and so much of what I want. It's like when George and I first started talking about me as a career, as a writer, the number one thing that I said to him was not, I want to make money and hit the New York times. And that was the, like the lists and things like that was never the most important thing for me. What I always said was I want to inspire people. I want to change people's lives. I want to make people feel like they're part of something. Um, and community was the number one thing. 
And because of COVID and everything else, we've built this community. And because of heart breathings, I have a community. And it's like, oh my gosh, I'm finally like living this dream life that I want, which this is more important to me. Like having 250 people here right now is more important to me than hitting number one on Apple because this is my dream right here. And so I feel like it's, I'm so much closer. And from here, I can see like the goal, you know, the gold medal. <laughs> and I feel like, it's, oh gosh, I wish I could say it. Like, I wish I could express it exactly the way I want. It's the most frustrating thing in the world to have an author who cannot quite say what she wants in words. But basically what I'm saying is I can look at the vision from where I'm standing now and I can see it's just little tweaks that need to happen before I'm going to go like 30 year old me. It was like major changes. Like I've got to get rid of this husband. I have to get rid of this job. I have to move to a whole new place. I have to change my whole life. And that was, a, I mean, that was where I was. And maybe some of you sitting here are in that place too. It's like, we, I have to change everything. And it's not, I encourage you to know that it's not something you have to do all at once, but even six months, eight months, a year of beginning to make those changes and finding the courage to start making those changes can change the next 30, 50 years of your life. And that is what I want to do, except where I am sitting here now is realizing it's not these huge, big changes. I have to quit my job, change my career. It's these little things like I really need to get my health in order. I really need to declutter my house so that my space feels more open for creativity. I really need to put more space in my daily life that, uh, that allows me to daydream more because so many of my most creative good ideas that have brought me the best success in the past have come out of downtime and I just don't have enough downtime. And yes, I did meet George when I was 30. I met him when I was 29. Um, but when I was 30, I got divorced. And then by the end of that year, we were living together. And that's how quickly like everything changed <laughs> for me. <laughs> but I feel like for me, there's just a few things still holding me back from where I really, really want to be and where I really need to go. And it's an internal journey, but it's also going to be uh, external results, I guess. So if I could guide you in how do you start thinking about what you want to do if you want to participate in the six months for life? Like how do you decide where to focus and that kind of thing is take some time to really daydream for yourself of what is my vision? Where do I want to be? Not just in six months, but like, what do I want my life to be? So think about your ideal day, your ideal week, your ideal, it, like the way you would feel on a daily basis. If you could just feel how you wanted to feel and is that how close are you and how many things in your life right now could you change that you have control over? Not to, you don't have to get all the way to the vision in six months, but it's just what little tweaks could you make to go ahead and start feeling that way right now? So let's say, for example, I, you know, you're busy like me and you feel like you're busy all the time and you get a lot done and you love all the things that you're doing, but you also don't have the time you need to daydream. What is a tweak that you could make in your life right now to start feeling that bit of like relief and space and less hustle that you could, you have control over that you could change right now. And then start thinking about that in terms of the next six months. So one of the things I want to do is I want to have one day a week where I just play like that I don't have any other, um, I'm not working, I don't have any other commitments. It's just a day off, you know, and I really don't have that. And it's not because I force myself, it's because I enjoy it. And I tend to want to work because I have so much I want to do. But I know the value of I need a day to just like rest and read and go to the beach and hang out with the kids. And I just need one day. But it it's not exactly uh, possible for me to just right now without an assistant, just be like 
I'm taking Sundays off from now on because I have so much on my plate that if I just immediately take Sundays off, I'm going to start to feel, yeah, I saw somebody say guilt. I'm going to feel guilt. I'm going to feel behind. I'm going to fall behind on things. So I think in the past, I've always been a very all or nothing kind of person where I'm like, okay, well, I have to start taking Sundays off or it's not worth it. Or I have to start this diet where I'm eating exactly this way. And if I mess up once and it's all over, right? And so part of my goal with the six month project is not to say our six months for life is not to say tomorrow, July 1st, this starts and I'm going to be absolutely perfect version of myself every single day, because that comes from a place of pressure. So instead, what I'm doing is I am thinking very hard and I have been thinking very hard and allowing myself to daydream about what can I change in my life now that is like the easy path. Let it let it be easy. Just say, what can I change now? What can I start doing now that's going to give me some of that extra freedom? You know what? I could start taking, you know, afternoons off to read. I could take this opportunity to, um, you know, maybe I can't get all of Sunday off, but maybe I can say, okay, as of noon, Sunday is my day. And then a month later say, okay, now I'm going to take all of Sunday off. And just incremental small changes that move me in the right direction. But more so than what I'm going to do, it's so much about what I am deciding. And that is a hard thing to express. But it's just this, what am I committing to? And I think that for me, it's always this very tricky line between wanting to take the baby steps without beating myself up in the process. Like, for example, talking about diet. I have struggled with my weight ever since I was in college and was first diagnosed with PCOS. And I have struggled with my hormones, struggled with my diet, struggled with my weight. But then after being sexually assaulted, it's just a natural thing I know from therapy to put extra weight on after that. Then I had a baby and even more weight came on and I had a hard time getting it off. And then I finally did take it all off because I was so wanting to get pregnant again. I was living near the water. It was one of my best years of my life in 2018. We just, I, I wrote more books than ever. We went to the beach all the time. We had, you know, we got pregnant with Evie. Just so many different things were going so well that year. And a big part of it was because I was eating in a way that really, um, made me feel good. And it wasn't like pressuring myself, even though I know we've talked about Brightline before, it's not right for everybody because so for some people it feels so restrictive that it would take away your joy. But for me at that time, it just felt so supportive and I just felt so good that it, blossomed out into so many other amazing things in my life. And so I want to get back to that place. Now that I've had another baby and put all that same weight on, I want to get back to that place where I'm eating in a way that makes me feel good, like eating to support myself rather than eating to numb myself. Um, and it has been harder to get back onto because I find that every time I try to go back to that way of eating, I am in a not in the right mindset, I think is how I would put it. I'm seeing it as restrictive now rather than seeing it as something that's supporting me. So I've been working over the last few weeks to try to get a better sense of how do I need to eat now to support myself? Maybe it's going to be bright line eating. Maybe it's going to be something that's a little bit modified where I can really like just start tapping into the way I feel more often and doing things that make me feel good that replace the way that feel good food makes me feel. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I do know that I eat to um, celebrate. I eat to numb my emotions. I eat to try to make myself feel better and all of that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think that healthy eating can be more expensive in some ways, but I will say we've been ever since COVID started, we've been ordering food or getting takeout so much more often. It is like five times more expensive than just eating healthy vegetables. <laughs> but I think in general, it can be more expensive. But um, I don't know. It depends how much you eat out and how much how much you eat, uh, you know, junk, kind of junky food, I guess. 
but <laughs> I joined a Facebook group called Lose Weight, Eat Pizza. <laughs> I think that you just have to find your own way. But I think that the more, I think that if you diet and you go into trying to eat right and you're doing nothing but saying negative things to yourself the whole time, like, I don't want to eat this. This is terrible. I'm never going to stick to it. Then it's probably not going to be really great for you long term. But the key for me when I did Brightline eating the first time is that I felt so supported and I thought this is going to make me feel good. And I was excited every day. Now I was super hungry for the first couple of weeks, but I was excited every day. And then I started seeing so much weight loss and so much like sleeping better, all these amazing benefits that I was like excited every day to eat what I wanted to eat. And I did, I ate that way for two years and I felt so good and I had such a healthy pregnancy and all this other stuff. And then afterward, I just let it all go. <laughs> I was like, nope, I'm going to eat whatever I want. And then it's, and I, I've been okay, but then, uh, I mean, I've had the weight gain too, but now I'm starting to see beyond just the weight gain, I'm starting to see the other things come back in, which is the high anxiety, the really bad um, other types of like pains that come with PCOS, the really bad depression and different things like that. And I know my hormones are out of whack and it's like, I've got to change this. Um, and yeah, it's, it's gotta be a lifestyle change because I think that if I, if I view it as a diet, then it becomes something that's temporary and then it just feels like punishment. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think that it's just, um, it's going to be a journey, but here's what I wrote down is like, if you're thinking of going on this journey with me, I'm starting tomorrow, but it's not an all or nothing kind of thing for me where I'm like, tomorrow's the day I have to get this many steps. And because this is the kind of stuff I've done in the past where I'm like, I'm going to change my lifestyle. So I make this list of all these like 20 things I'm going to do. I'm going to get six hours of sleep. I'm going to drink 80 ounces of water. I've got my fitness tracker here. I'm going to um, start getting 10,000 steps a day. I'm going to eat perfect. I'm going to do this. And I would make this long list of everything that I wanted to do. Um, and then of course it would be so hard to keep up with that many different things because then I would like miss my water for three days and not get the steps. And then I feel like I'm failing. And so I'm taking that idea that I use in HB 90 of building positive momentum. And that's where I'm starting tomorrow, not starting with, I have to do these 20 things. Instead, I'm starting with, okay, we're going to start, I'm going to start like eliminating a few things from my diet. I'm going to start wearing my fitness tracker and kind of seeing what my baseline is. I'm going to start trying to drink a little bit more water and it's just going to be super baby steps. So by the end of July, maybe my, I've got the water down pat and it's more of a, a healthy habit. Or by the end of July, maybe I'm like no longer drinking sugary drinks or coffees or anything like that. So I'm taking it kind of one step at a time instead of putting so much pressure because I'm seeing this six months as a time frame where I'm going to point myself in the right direction rather than being a time frame where I have to take such like perfect action that I'm a failure unless I do it all just right. And so it's going to be a journey, but starting in the morning, I am going to take some before and after photos. I actually have bought from Amazon. Um, obviously I will share these photos with you guys um, in the vlogs, but just no, ju no judgment. I think the biggest thing that bothers me about the weight gain for my particular body is that you know, overall, it's not terrible. Like you could see it in my face and my arms, but like the worst thing is when I stand up, I still kind of look pregnant because when you have PCOS, you have, it all goes right there in your stomach. And it's just, it's, it's never a good feeling to walk out of your house and be scared that your neighbors are going to ask when the babies do, because that has happened to me so many times. I can't even tell you. And it's, I don't want to go to the grocery store and be asked when the baby's coming when I've, had, you know, had a baby two years ago. That's the worst, worst thing. Um, and I don't want to lose this weight just because I of other people. But at the same time, I want to feel my most confident self. And I can't do that when I'm scared of how people see me. So there's, there's this change that has to happen for me internally, but I also want to change to get my body healthier, if that makes sense. And I'm trying to word it in such a way that I don't make anybody feel judged out there because this is just my own thing. But I will show you guys when the vlogs happen. Um, you'll see just how much it just really still looks. I would say I look at least four or five months pregnant um, at, at all times. To My baby's almost two years old. Um, and I am going to take those weekly photos. I bought on Amazon, I bought some like kind of like biker shorts. 
and uh, like sports bra. And I bought them in like extra large size. And then I also bought them in large and in medium and in small. And I'm like, okay, I've got all the sizes here <laughs> and we're going to just keep, I'm going to keep working on going down and going down and going down and it's going to be great. Um, and you know, and what is that? It's like people, people just need to know that you shouldn't ask people if they're pregnant. But I really do think that it's something about the food that we're eating that we're kind of being shoved down our throats in advertising and other things like all the all the sugar in everything that just kind of that's where it lands in certain women's bodies is in that kind of stomach area. Um, so people just need to learn. <laughs> Some people like some people actually are pregnant, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel's 37 weeks right now. Um, but yeah, it's just for me, this is just where it is. And it's it PCOS is definitely one place that it it goes. And it's like I I want to be able to love myself as I am, but I also just don't want to look pregnant. And it, it prevents some of the outfits that I want to wear. And I feel like I have um a love for like style and fashion, but there's so many things that I love to wear that I can't wear because I feel like it just makes me look even worse. And I just want to be able to be in a place where I can wear whatever I want and I feel really good and confident in it. And so that's one of the things like when I vis have this vision for my future, what do I want to change? What can I control? What can I do? And I'm like, um, you know, I can change the way that I eat but I want to do it in a healthy way that feels really good to me. Um, so if you're thinking of going on this journey, I encourage you to do some daydreaming about what, what is that future version of yourself look and go, you can go out five years, you can go out 20 years, depending on your age and what you feel com comfortable going out to just go to a future. It could be a year from now and just a picture. What would feel really good? What kind of life feels really good to you and picture yourself in that life and get the vision. And then when you come back from that vision, think how was that life feel different than this life that I have now? And some of you may find that as you do that, it's so crazy different that you are going to need some major differences in your life. And if that is true, then I highly recommend that you get some support like therapy, you talk through it with your friends, you know, before you start making these huge changes, make sure you have like a safety net or a plan in place. But for those of us that it's like, it's just these little tweaks, like getting my health back into a better place, taking a little bit more time off, really drinking more water, doing like just more things that are fun instead of things that are stressful. Like for example, just one simple thing that I can do to make myself feel better is to start writing on a daily basis instead of waiting until I've got a deadline and then binge writing at the last minute. Now it does work for me to some degree, but it's so stressful that it destroys the whole family for weeks on end. And it's like, I love writing. Why don't I just sit down and do it every day? But I know that I'm not going to be able to sit down tomorrow and start an instant habit. So it's going to be baby steps to get where I want to go. So visualize the future that you want and then take stock of what, where am I now versus where I want to be. And then when you write down all those differences, start thinking where, what can I change about where I am right now? that will actually affect and start moving me toward where I want to be. And I always start with feeling. How do I want to feel? How does this future version of me feel different from this version? Okay, she's more confident because she's more stylish. She doesn't get asked if she's pregnant all the time. <laughs> she doesn't, you know, she, she has more confidence in herself because she's maybe lost 20 or 30 pounds. She's eating better. So she feels better. There's no more afternoons, you know, lag. There's like, think about all the benefits, all the changes that you can make that will help you to feel the way you want to feel. I want to feel a little, I want to feel less stressed. I want to be able to walk into my office and have it not be a complete mess. I didn't even get a chance to clean it up right now. So there's like stuff everywhere. Um, and that's, you know, that's the kind of things I'm talking about. And so what I did was I looked at that vision and then I looked at my life and compared my life to that vision and started thinking, what of, what of this do I have control over? And so then I made a decision. Okay, here's the things I don't have control over. 
I do not have control over whether or not my book hits a list or whether or not thousands of people buy my book. I don't have control over how many YouTube subscribers I have. I don't have control over whether this house is going to work out. So um, Hannah had asked about the house. Our builder uh, canceled the contract on the house. They canceled all 14 contracts on all these, all of us that were building our houses with them. Um, and apparently builders are doing this all over the country. They sent us back our earnest money and they're telling us in a few months, they will let us know now what they will charge us for that house. And our realtor said it's probably going to be at least $80,000 more than what we contracted. And then once they tell us the new price, we will have 72 hours to say whether or not we'll pay it or not. Um, and there's nothing else on the market right now. Um, there's literally no houses, zero houses on the market that are in our price range that have what we need because I have to have an office to work from. Um, so we're just kind of have to trust, right? We're, we're in a place where we're like, well, this is, you know, we compared to a lot of people in the world, we were relatively uh, cushioned from COVID problems because George and I were already working from home. So this is our this is our COVID cost right now is the um, this fallout from the house. And it is legal. Sadly, it is legal um, because there are any anybody who builds a house. Uh, there's always a, a clause in the contract that basically says that if there's extenuating circumstances that affect their house, price and stuff that they can cancel it. And because the market here in Charleston has gone up by that much, they can turn around and charge those prices. There's we've, uh, we've cons consulted attorneys. It's happening to people all over the country. And so it's just like, I mean, their costs did go up. Their costs absolutely went up, but they did sign a contract at the same time. So it's just, it's, yeah, that's exactly the thing, Stephanie. It sucks for everybody. Um, what is frustrating for me right now is that the house is almost done. So they know what it costs, but they still want to give it four months to see how much the market goes up here before they give us a cost. Um, but that gives us, that puts us in a tough place because our, we don't know where we're going to put our son in school for the year. We don't know where we're going to be. There's just, there's, we also don't have a lease on this house past the end of August. So we're just going to have to trust, right? Um, but what I can't, I can't control that. But what I can control is how this house feels. And right now I have too much stuff. I've brought in all these planners and it's been super fun. And I love having the Erin Condren collabs and different things like that. But I have too much and I don't really have room for it. So decluttering is on my list. So I encourage you to think about how you want to feel and what things are currently in your life that you have control over that you can change. Because I can't control what the people do with the house, but I can control what I do with my current house and how I do. Um, and I can control what I put in my mouth to a degree. And I'm not going to expect myself to be perfect because I want to feel good. So my goal in over the next six months is to feel as good as possible, to continue to work on the things that I know are holding me back, like limiting beliefs, like um, places where I still self-sabotage myself, um, and I want to start supporting myself with routines and other things that support my health, both my mental health and my physical health. And I really am. This was a big moment for me with this book is putting my foot down and saying, I am not going to sacrifice my mental health, even if it hurts my career and my income. And that is a privileged place to be because I can afford to say that. But it's also a powerful place to be able to say, I have finally set these boundaries for myself. And now I can choose now that the book is over to work in a, in a way that is going to support me in the future. Um, two things. I keep, I keep like trying to say it and then I don't fully say it. Ah, okay. So vision, how is the vision of the future different from now? What can you control that you can start to slowly change over the next six months? that will bring you closer to that vision. And then what has to change? So looking at yourself and saying, okay, like these things I can control, but what has to change is this. I have to stop beating myself up so much. I have to stop buy like shopping and buying stuff when I, before I 
declutter this house? Like, what are the things that have to change in order for me to like, what's totally standing in the way between me and that future life? Like I could still be rich and famous and happy, even if I still weigh 200 pounds. So that doesn't have to change. But I know what does have to change to for me to have my best life is I have to have more time off. Does that make sense? It's like, here's the things that are non-negotiable. So identify your non-negotiables and then take baby steps in the right direction and just make a choice. It's like a commitment that you say, starting tomorrow on July 1st through the end of this year, I commit to doing the work that is necessary on myself to start taking baby steps towards better mental health and feeling the way that I want to feel. Um, I will have, I have my plum paper planner. So I'm going to be, this is the planner I'm going to be using for it. And it's so cute and my nails match it. And I'm so happy with that. I chose this nail color because it just makes me happy. It's like my favorite and it's like matching my post-it notes and my planner and everything else. <laughs> um, but I'm going to be using this planner to really track those areas. And again, we have, we did talk about those areas a little bit. So I will be doing a flip through of this planner. I had hoped to have it up by today, but I just didn't have time. I was too busy celebrating, but I've got my energy, my happy home, which is the decluttering joyful, which is bringing more joy into my life glow up, which is the like fitness and weight loss stuff, um, movement. So that's just, it. I don't have to do major movement, but I do want to do more walks and I want to start exercising a little bit because it's so important for my hormones to be doing some exercise and then soul fuel, which is just the like daydreaming time and the um, tarot and stuff. So I got this rebirth candle from house of intuition and I am going to be lighting this tonight and it probably will stay lit for about four days, I think. But this is going, I'm going to be doing some meditations with this candle, this rebirth candle. It doesn't really have a scent to it. Um, I also got this beautiful ring in today, which was the perfect day to get it. This is a handmade ring from Etsy. It took about a month to come in, but it's got a citrine on it and a dragonfly. And then inside it says believe, which I love. Um, so this is my new ring. Um, and these categories are written down in my planner. So I will do a flip through of it. But this is the um, plum paper planner. It's called the me layout. And it won't show up probably terribly well here. But you can kind of see how it has little blocks and all of those things are laid out on this um, planner. So I have I have all of those little categories pre done here. And my for me, using the planner is all about connecting it to routine. So I'm going to uh, fill this out in the mornings and in the evenings. So it's going to kind of go into my morning and evening routine. But I will do a flip through of this planner before this week is over. And then hopefully this weekend, it is going to, um, I'm going to do my first vlog. And I don't know how often I'll be doing the vlogs, but in the vlogs, I will actually be showing my before photos. I'll be showing kind of some of the things that I'm thinking about and how I'm choosing what I'm going to be focused on, how the meal plan is going. I will actually be showing the cleanups of my house and what I'm getting rid of, how I'm decluttering things. And I'm going to take you guys through that process, but I'm not going to commit to like a vlog every single week because that would be counter to giving myself more time and space. So um, it's going to be probably every two weeks or it might just not be on a schedule. It might just be whenever they're ready to go. Uh, but I will keep you guys updated on that. But I do have a uh, flip through planned for this. So I'm talk a little bit more, but if you're planning to join, come join our discord server. There's a link in the description box here on YouTube. We have a new channel that just went up today called six months for life. And I know some of you are calling it six months to a new me or six months to rise. So name it whatever you want to, but George set up a discord channel. We also have now a discord channel for camp NaNoWriMo or for all the NaNoWriMo events come join us. It's a great community and it's off Facebook. So it's kind of just like live chat. And if you want to, you can join us for, um, you know, if you want to share photos, if you want to share what you're eating, what you're planning to do. Uh, but there's no requirements here. It doesn't have to be diet based. It can literally just be, I really want to read more um, and stuff like that. So let us know what you want to do, but think about how you can, what you can do now to make your life feel a little bit more like your dream life. Like you don't, if there's one thing I could really get through 
is to say, so often we think when we make the vision boards, we think that I'll be happy when I get to the point that I have this million dollar house and I have this career and I'm number one on Apple books or, you know, whatever. We think it's those external things that will make us happy. But really the thing that makes us happy is how we feel. And we have a lot more control over how we feel on a day-to-day basis right now in the house we live in now with the career we have now with the house we have now the room we have now we have more control over how we feel than we think we do and even just saying that i felt a little bit dizzy because i know that it's truth because i used to want the bigger house the better career and then when i got it i was still depressed And it wasn't until I started thinking about, okay, then how do I want to feel and started understanding that that healing has to come from inside more so than the outside. And then once you get yourself feeling good, all of those outside things will start to happen and then you're going to enjoy it. And so that's the real key of the six months project. So we will talk more about it. Friday, we will have a regular coffee chat. So if you want to ask more questions about this, you can definitely do that. Um, And it'll just be a normal coffee chat next week, because in the US here, we have our 4th of July weekend is coming up. And then George's birthday is the following weekend. So next week, we are taking the week off and we are going on a family vacation. So the three of us are the four of us will be gone for all Monday, Wednesday, and Friday next week. Um, And then the week after that, it's like July 12th, I think, we will finally start reading Rival Demons again. And we will go Monday and Wednesday for Rival Demons for the next several weeks. And then as soon as that is over, we will move straight into Demons Forever. So thank you for being on hold with the readings. We will do a major recap of everything that happened over the first you know, half of the book um, because there's some really cool stuff coming up. Um, and then in between that, there will be these blogs that will appear. But if you really want to like, we'll talk about them on our Friday coffee chats and we'll talk about them in the Discord channel. So come join us over there. All right, you guys, what a great group. I know we've gone over an hour, but wow, over 260 people here at one point, which I think is one of our largest groups. So thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I made some sense about, (laughs) um, you know, about what I was trying to say, but it is all exciting stuff. So the writing retreat for July, every writing retreat is always the third weekend. So just go onto your calendar and find whatever's the third weekend that has July in it. And that is the weekend, but I don't have the dates right in front of me. I could probably find them since I have a calendar. One, two, three, 16th, 17th, 18th. And I think we're going to Iceland potentially. Um, I don't know if Renee's here, but anyway, all right, it's going to be good. You guys, it'll be fun. Come join us on discord and you can, there's a coffee chat section in discord to ask questions. Or um, if Christabel wants to put a post up, I don't know if there is one um, for Friday, if you wouldn't mind, that would be great. But thank you guys for celebrating with me. I cannot believe the book is out in the world and so many of you are reading it and I've been so nervous, but don't forget to go and leave a review. Um, and grab the book. I hope you enjoy it. If you have not read any of my Shadow Demon Saga yet, go check them out. Or I know some of you are just reading, um, you're just reading it here with us. So you're waiting for me to get back to Rival Demons. So we will be doing that on July 12th. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you guys so very much. And I will see you all on Friday. Thank you. I'll make sure Evie's around, but today she had a little boo-boo on her head. So I think she's, she's playing with George. So we will see you guys Friday. Thank you guys. Love you. Bye.